third quarter of the chimes by charles dickens this librivox recording is in the public domain black are the brooding clouds and troubled the deep waters when the sea of thought first heaving from a calm gives up its dead monsters uncouth and wild arise in premature imperfect resurrection the several parts and shapes of different things are joined and mixed by chance and when and how and by what wonderful degrees each separates from each and every sense and object of the mind resumes its usual form and lives again no man though every man is every day the casket of this type of the great mystery can tell so when and how the darkness of the night-black steeple changed to shining light when and how the solitary tower was peopled with a myriad figures when and how the whispered haunt and hunt him breathing monotonously through his sleep or swoon became a voice exclaiming in the waking ears of trotty break his slumbers when and how he ceased to have a sluggish and confused idea that such things were companioning a host of others that were not there are no dates or means to tell but awake and standing on his feet upon the boards where he had lately lain he saw this goblin sight he saw the tower whither his charmed footsteps had brought him swarming with dwarf phantoms spirits elfin creatures of the bells he saw them leaping flying dropping pouring from the bells without a pause he saw them round him on the ground above him in the air clambering from him by the ropes below looking down upon him from the massive iron girded beams peeping in upon him through the chinks and loopholes in the walls spreading away and away from him in enlarging circles as the water ripples give way to a huge stone that suddenly comes plashing in among them he saw them of all aspects and all shapes he saw them ugly handsome crippled exquisitely formed he saw them young he saw them old he saw them kind he saw them cruel he saw them merry he saw them grim he saw them dance and heard them sing he saw them tear their hair and heard them howl he saw the air thick with them he saw them come and go incessantly he saw them riding downwards soaring upward sailing off afar perching near at hand all restless and all violently active stone and brick and slate and tile became transparent to him as to them he saw them in the houses busy at the sleepers beds he saw them soothing people in their dreams he saw them beating them with knotted whips he saw them yelling in their ears he saw them playing softest music on their pillows he saw them cheering some with the songs of birds and the perfume of flowers he saw them flashing awful faces on the troubled rest of others from enchanted mirrors which they carried in their hands he saw these creatures not only among sleeping men but waking also active in pursuits irreconcilable with one another and possessing or assuming natures the most opposite he saw one buckling on innumerable wings to increase his speed another loading himself with chains and weights to retard his he saw some putting the hands of clocks forward some putting the hands of clocks backward some endeavouring to stop the clock entirely he saw them representing here a marriage ceremony there a funeral in this chamber an election in that a ball he saw everywhere 
restless and untiring motion. Bewildered by the host of shifting and extraordinary figures, as well as by the uproar of the bells, which all this while were ringing, Trotty clung to a wooden pillar for support, and turned his white face here and there in mute and stunned astonishment. As he gazed, the chime stopped. Instantaneous change. The whole swarm fainted. Their forms collapsed. Their speed deserted them. They sought to fly, but in the act of falling, died and melted into air. No fresh supply succeeded them. One straggler leapt down pretty briskly from the surface of the great bell and alighted on his feet but he was dead and gone before he could turn round. Some few of the late company who had gambled in the tower remained there, spinning over and over a little longer, but these became at every turn more faint and few and feeble, and soon went the way of the rest. The last of all was one small hunchback, who had got into an echoing corner, where he twirled and twirled, and floated by himself a long time, showing such perseverance that at last he dwindled to a leg and even to a foot before he finally retired. But he vanished in the end, and then the tower was silent. Then, and not before, did Trotty see in every bell a bearded figure of the Balkan stature of the bell, incomprehensibly a figure and the bell itself, gigantic, grave and darkly watchful of him as he stood rooted to the ground. Mysterious and awful figures, resting on nothing, poised in the night air of the tower, with their draped and hooded heads merged in the dim roof, motionless and shadowy. Shadowy and dark, although he saw them by some light belonging to themselves, none else was there, each with its muffled hand upon its goblin mouth. He could not plunge down wildly through the opening in the floor, for all power of motion had deserted him, Otherwise he would have done so. I would have thrown himself head foremost from the steeple-top, rather than have seen them watching him with eyes that would have waked and watched, although the pupils had been taken out. Again, again, the dread and terror of the lonely place, and of the wild and fearful night that reigned there, touched him like a spectral hand. His distance from all help, the long, dark, winding, ghost-beleaguered way that lay between him and the earth on which men lived, his being high, high, high up there, where it had made him dizzy to see the birds fly in the day, cut off from all good people who at such an hour were safe at home and sleeping in their beds. All this struck coldly through him, not as a reflection, but a bodily sensation. Meantime, his eyes and thoughts and fears were fixed upon the watchful figures, which, rendered unlike any figures of this world by the deep gloom and shade in wrapping and enfolding them, as well as by their looks and forms and supernatural hovering above the floor, were nevertheless as plainly to be seen as were the stalwart oaken frames, cross-pieces, bars and beams set up there to support the bells. These hemmed them in a very forest of hewn timber, from the entanglements, intricacies and depths of which as from among the boughs of a dead wood blighted for their phantom use, they kept their darksome and unwinking watch. A blast of air, how cold and shrill, came moaning through the tower. As it died away, 
the great bell or the goblin of the great bell spoke what visitor is this it said the voice was low and deep and trotty fancied that it sounded in the other figures as well i thought my name was called by the chimes said trotty raising his hands in an attitude of supplication i hardly know why i am here or how i came i have listened to the chimes these many years they have cheered me often and you have thanked them said the bell a thousand times cried trotty how i am a poor man faltered trotty and could only thank them in words and always so inquired the goblin of the bell have you never done a throng in words no cried trotty eagerly never done us foul and false and wicked wrong in words pursued the goblin of the bell trotty was about to answer never but he stopped and was confused the voice of time said the phantom cries to man advance time is for his advancement and improvement for his greater worth his greater happiness his better life his progress onward to that goal within its knowledge and its view and set there in the period when time and he began ages of darkness wickedness and violence have come and gone millions uncountable have suffered lived and died to point the way before him who seeks to turn him back or stay him on his course arrests a mighty engine which will strike the meddler dead and be the fiercer and the wilder ever for its momentary check i never did so to my knowledge sir said trotty it was quite by accident if i did i wouldn't go to do it i'm sure who puts into the mouth of time or of its servants said the goblin of the bell a cry of lamentation for days which have had their trial and their failure and have left deep traces of it which the blind may see a cry that only serves the present time by showing men how much it needs their help when any ears can listen to regrets for such a past who does this does a wrong and you have done that wrong to us the chimes trotty's first excess of fear was gone but he had felt tenderly and gratefully towards the bells as you have seen and when he heard himself arraigned as one who had offended them so weightily his heart was touched with penitence and grief if you knew said trotty clasping his hands earnestly or perhaps you do know if you know how often you have kept me company how often you have cheered me up when i have been low how you were quite the plaything of my little daughter meg almost the only one she ever had when first her mother died and she and me were left alone you won't bear malice for a hasty word who hears in us the chimes one note bespeaking disregard or stern regard of any hope or joy or pain or sorrow of the many sorrowed throng who hears us make response to any creed that gauges human passions and affections 
as it gauges the amount of miserable food on which humanity may pine and wither, does us wrong. That wrong you have done us, said the bell. I have, said Trotty. Oh, forgive me. Who hears us echo the dull vermin of the earth? the putters down of crushed and broken natures formed to be raised up higher than such maggots of the time can crawl or can conceive pursued the goblin of the bell who does so does us wrong and you have done us wrong not meaning it said trotty in my ignorance not meaning it lastly and most of all pursued the bell who turns his back upon the fallen and disfigured of his kind abandons them as vile and does not trace and track with pitying eyes the unfenced precipice by which they fell from good grasping in their fall some tufts and shreds of that lost soil and clinging to them still when bruised and dying in the gulf below does wrong to heaven and man to time and to eternity and you have done that wrong spare me cried trotty falling on his knees for mercy's sake listen said the shadow listen cried the other shadows listen said a clear and childlike voice which trotty thought he recognised as having heard before the organ sounded faintly in the church below swelling by degrees the melody ascended to the roof and filled the choir and nave expanding more and more it rose up 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 higher 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 up awakening agitated hearts within the burly piles of oak the hollow bells the iron-bound doors the stairs of solid stone until the tower walls were insufficient to contain it and it soared into the sky no wonder that an old man's breast could not contain a sound so vast and mighty it broke from that weak prison in a rush of tears and trotty put his hands before his face listen said the shadow listen said the other shadows listen said the child's voice a solemn strain of blended voices rose into the tower it was a very low and mournful strain a dirge and as he listened trotty heard his child among the singers she is dead exclaimed the old man meg is dead her spirit calls to me i hear it the spirit of your child bewails the dead and mingles with the dead dead hopes dead fancies dead imaginings of youth returned the bell but she is living learn from her life a living truth learn from the creature dearest to your heart how bad the bad are born see every bud and leaf plucked one by one from off the fairest stem and know how bare and wretched it may be follow her to desperation each of the shadowy figures stretched its right arm forth and pointed downward 
the spirit of the chimes is your companion said the figure go it stands behind you trotty turned and saw the child the child will fern had carried in the street the child whom meg had watched but now asleep i carried her myself to-night said trotty in these arms show him what he calls himself said the dark figures one and all the tower opened at his feet he looked down and beheld his own form lying at the bottom on the outside crushed and motionless no more a living man cried trotty dead dead said the figures all together gracious heaven and the new year past said the figures what he cried shuddering i missed my way and coming on the outside of this tower in the dark fell down a year ago nine years ago replied the figures as they gave the answer they recalled their outstretched hands and where their figures had been there the bells were and they rung their time being come again and once again vast multitudes of phantoms sprung into existence once again were incoherently engaged as they had been before once again faded on the stopping of the chimes and dwindled into nothing what are these he asked his guide if i am not mad what are these spirits of the bells their sound upon the air returned the child they take such shapes and occupations as the hopes and thoughts of mortals and the recollections they have stored up give them and you said trotty wildly what are you hush hush returned the child look here in a poor mean room working at the same kind of embroidery which he had often often seen before her meg his own dear daughter was presented to his view he made no effort to imprint his kisses on her face he did not strive to clasp her to his loving heart he knew that such endearments were for him no more but he held his trembling breath and brushed away the blinding tears that he might look upon her that he might only see her ah oh, changed changed the light of the clear eye how dimmed the bloom how faded from the cheek beautiful she was as she had ever been but hope 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 oh where was the fresh hope that had spoken to him like a voice she looked up from her work at a companion following her eyes the old man started back in the woman grown he recognized her at a glance in the long silken hair he saw the self-same curls around the lips the child's expression lingering still see in the eyes now turned inquiringly on meg there shone the very look that scanned those features when he brought her home then what was this beside him looking with awe into its face he saw a something reigning there a lofty something undefined and indistinct which made it hardly more than a remembrance of that child as yonder figure might be yet it was the same the same and wore the dress hark they were speaking meg said lilian hesitating 
how often you raise your head from your work to look at me are my looks so altered that they frighten you asked meg nay dear but you smile at that yourself why not smile when you look at me meg i do so do i not she answered smiling on her now you do said lilian but not usually when you think i'm busy and don't see you you look so anxious and so doubtful that i hardly like to raise my eyes there is little cause for smiling in this hard and toilsome life but you were once so cheerful am i not now cried meg speaking in a tone of strange alarm and rising to embrace her do i make our weary life more weary to you lilian you have been the only thing that made it life said lilian fervently kissing her sometimes the only thing that made me care to live so meg such work such work so many hours so many days so many long long nights of hopeless cheerless never-ending work not to heap up riches not to live grandly or gaily not to live upon enough however coarse but to earn bare bread to scrape together just enough to toil upon and want upon and keep alive in us the consciousness of our hard fate oh meg meg she raised her voice and twined her arms about her as she spoke like one in pain how can the cruel world go round and bear to look upon such lives lily said meg soothing her and putting back her hair from her wet face why lily you so pretty and so young oh meg she interrupted holding her at arm's length and looking in her face imploringly the worst of all the worst of all strike me old meg wither me and shrivel me and free me from the dreadful thoughts that tempt me in my youth trotty turned to look upon his guide but the spirit of the child had taken flight was gone neither did he himself remain in the same place for sir joseph bowley friend and father of the poor held a great festivity at bowley hall in honour of the natal day of lady bowley and as lady bowley had been born on new year's day which the local newspapers considered an especial pointing of the finger of providence to number one as lady bowley's destined figure in creation it was on a new year's day that this festivity took place bowley hall was full of visitors the red-faced gentleman was there mr filer was there the great alderman cute was there alderman cute had a sympathetic feeling with great people and had considerably improved his acquaintance with sir joseph bowley on the strength of his attentive letter indeed had become quite a friend of the family since then and many guests were there trotty's ghost was there wandering about poor phantom drearily and looking for its guide there was to be a great dinner in the great hall at which sir joseph bowley in his celebrated character of friend and father of the poor was to make his great speech certain plum puddings were to be eaten by his friends and children in another hall first and at a given signal friends and children flocking in among their friends and fathers were to form a family assemblage with not one manly eye therein unmoistened by emotion but there was more than this to happen even more than this sir joseph bowley baronet and member of parliament was to play a match at skittles real skittles with his tenants which quite reminds me said alderman cute 
of the days of old King Hal, stout King Hal, bluff King Hal, ah, fine character. Very, said Mr. Filer dryly, for marrying women and murdering em considerably more than the average number of wives, by the by. "'You'll marry the beautiful ladies and not murder em, eh?' said Alderman Cute to the heir of Bowley, aged twelve. "'Sweet boy, we shall have this little gentleman in Parliament now,' said the Alderman, holding him by the shoulders and looking as reflective as he could. "'Before we know where we are.' we shall hear of his successes at the poll his speeches in the house his overtures from governments his brilliant achievements of all kinds ah we shall make our little orations about him in the common council i'll be bound before we have time to look about us oh the difference of shoes and stockings trotty thought but his heart yearned towards the child for the love of those same shoeless and stockingless boys predestined by the alderman to turn out bad, who might have been the children of poor Meg. "'Richard,' moaned Trotty, roaming among the company to and fro, "'where is he? I can't find Richard. Where is Richard?' not likely to be there if still alive. But Trotty's grief and solitude confused him, and he still went wandering among the gallant company looking for his guide, and saying, Where is Richard? Show me Richard. He was wandering thus when he encountered Mr. Fish, the confidential secretary, in great agitation. Bless my heart and soul, cried Mr. Fish. Where's Alderman Cute? Has anybody seen the Alderman? Seen the Alderman? Oh, dear, who could ever help seeing the Alderman? He was so considerate, so affable. He bore so much in mind the natural desires of folks to see him, that if he had a fault, it was the being constantly on view and wherever the great people were there to be sure attracted by the kindred sympathy between great souls was cute several voices cried that he was in the circle round sir joseph mr fish made way there found him and took him secretly into a window near at hand trotty joined them not of his own accord he felt that his steps were led in that direction. "'My dear Alderman Cute,' said Mr. Fish, "'a little more this way. The most dreadful circumstance has occurred. I have this moment received the intelligence. I think it will be best not to acquaint Sir Joseph with it till the day is over.' You understand, Sir Joseph, and will give me your opinion. The most frightful and deplorable event. Fish, returned the alderman. Fish, my good fellow, what is the matter? Nothing revolutionary, I hope. No, no attempted interference with the magistrates. Deedles the banker, gasped the secretary. Deedles, brothers who was to have been here to-day high in office in the goldsmith's company not stopped exclaimed the alderman it can't be shot himself good god put a double-barrelled pistol to his mouth in his own counting-house said mr fish and blew his brains out no motive princely circumstances circumstances exclaimed the alderman a man of noble fortune one of the most respectable of men suicide mr fish by his own hand this very morning returned mr fish oh the brain the brain exclaimed the pious alderman, lifting up his hands. 
oh the nerves the nerves the mysteries of this machine called man oh the little that unhinges it poor creatures that we are perhaps a dinner mr fish perhaps the conduct of his son who i have heard ran very wild and was in the habit of drawing bills upon him without the least authority a most respectable man one of the most respectable men i ever knew a lamentable instance mr fish a public calamity i shall make a point of wearing the deepest mourning a most respectable man but there is one above we must submit mr fish we must submit what alderman no word of putting down remember justice your high moral boast and pride come alderman balance those scales throw me into this the empty one no dinner and nature's founts in some poor woman dried by starving misery and rendered obdurate to claims for which her offspring has authority in holy mother eve weigh me the two you daniel going to judgment when your day shall come weigh them in the eyes of suffering thousands audience not unmindful of the grim farce you play or supposing that you strayed from your five wits it's not so far to go but that it might be and laid hands upon that throat of yours warning your fellows if you have a fellow how they croak their comfortable wickedness to raving heads and stricken hearts what then the words rose up in trotty's breast as if they had been spoken by some other voice within him alderman cute pledged himself to mr fish that he would assist him in breaking the melancholy catastrophe to sir joseph when the day was over then before they parted wringing mr fish's hand in bitterness of soul he said the most respectable of men and added that he hardly knew not even he why such afflictions were allowed on earth it's almost enough to make one think if one didn't know better said alderman cute that at times some motion of a capsizing nature was going on in things which affected the general economy of the social fabric deedles brothers the skittle playing came off with immense success sir joseph knocked the pins about quite skilfully master bowley took an innings at a shorter distance also and everybody said that now when a baronet and the son of a baronet played at skittles the country was coming round again as fast as it could come at its proper time the banquet was served up trotty involuntarily repaired to the hall with the rest for he felt himself conducted thither by some stronger impulse than his own free will the sight was gay in the extreme the ladies were very handsome the visitors delighted cheerful and good-tempered when the lower doors were opened and the people flocked in in their rustic dresses the beauty of the spectacle was at its height but trotty only murmured more and more where is richard he should help and comfort her i can't see richard there had been some speeches made and lady bowley's health had been proposed and sir joseph bowley had returned thanks and had made his great speech showing by various pieces of evidence that he was the born friend and father and so forth and had given as a toast his friends and children and the dignity of labour when a slight disturbance at the bottom of the hall attracted toby's notice 
after some confusion noise and opposition one man broke through the rest and stood forward by himself not richard no but one whom he had thought of and had looked for many times in a scantier supply of light he might have doubted the identity of that worn man so old and grey and bent but with a blaze of lamps upon his gnarled and knotted head he knew will fern as soon as he stepped forth what is this exclaimed sir joseph rising who gave this man admittance this is a criminal from prison mr fish sir will you have the goodness a minute said wilfern a minute my lady you was born on this day along with a new year get me a minute's leave to speak she made some intercession for him sir joseph took his seat again with native dignity the ragged visitor for he was miserably dressed looked round upon the company and made his homage to them with a humble bow gentle folks he said you've drunk the labourer look at me just come from jail said mr fish just come from jail said will and neither for the first time nor the second nor the third nor yet the fourth mr filer was heard to remark testily that four times was over the average and he ought to be ashamed of himself gentle folks repeated will fern look at me you see i'm at the worst beyond all hurt or harm beyond your help for the time when your kind words or kind actions could have done me good he struck his hand upon his breast and shook his head is gone with the scent of last year's beans or clover on the air let me say a word for these pointing to the labouring people in the hall and when you're met together hear the real truth spoke out for once there's not a man here said the host who would have him for a spokesman like enough sir joseph i believe it not the less true perhaps is what i say perhaps that's a proof on it gentle folks i've lived many a year in this place you may see the cottage from the sunk fence over yonder i've seen the ladies draw it in their books a hundred times it looks well in a picture i've heard say but there ain't weather in pictures and maybe tis fitter for that than for a place to live in well i lived there how hard how bitter hard i lived there i won't say any day in the year and every day you can judge for your own selves he spoke as he had spoken on the night when trotty found him in the street his voice was deeper and more husky and had a trembling in it now and then but he never raised it passionately and seldom lifted it above the firm stern level of the homely facts he stated tis harder than you think for gentle folks to grow up decent commonly decent in such a place that i growed up a man and not a brute says something for me as i was then as i am now there is nothing that can be said for me or done for me i'm past it i am glad this man has entered observed sir joseph looking round serenely don't disturb him it appears to be ordained he is an example a living example i hope and trust and confidently expect that it will not be lost upon my friends here i dragged on said fern after a moment's silence somehow 
neither me nor any other man knows how but so heavy that i couldn't put a cheerful face upon it or make believe that i was anything but what i was now gentlemen you gentlemen that sits at sessions when you see a man with discontent writ on his face you says to one another he's suspicious i has my doubts says you about will fern watch that fellow i don't say gentlemen it ain't quite natural but i say tis so and from that hour whatever will fern does or lets alone all one it goes against him alderman cute stuck his thumbs in his waistcoat pockets and leaning back in his chair and smiling winked at a neighbouring chandelier as much as to say of course i told you so the common cry lord bless you we are up to all this sort of thing myself and human nature now gentlemen said will fern holding out his hands and flushing for an instant in his haggard face see how your laws are made to trap and hunt us when we're brought to this i tries to live elsewhere and i'm a vagabond to jail with him i comes back here i goes a nutting in your woods and breaks who don't a limber branch or two to jail with him one of your keepers sees me in the broad day near my own patch of garden with a gun to jail with him i has a natural angry word with that man when i'm free again to jail with him i cuts a stick to jail with him i eats a rotten apple or a turnip to jail with him it's twenty mile away and coming back i begs a trifle on the road to jail with him at last the constable the keeper anybody finds me anywhere a doing anything to jail with him for he's a vagrant and a jailbird known and jail's the only home he's got the alderman nodded sagaciously as who should say a very good home too do i say this to serve my cause cried fern who can give me back my liberty who can give me back my good name who can give me back my innocent niece not all the lords and ladies in wide england but gentlemen gentlemen dealing with other men like me begin at the right end give us in mercy better homes when we're a-lying in our cradles give us better food when we're a-working for our lives give us kinder laws to bring us back when we're a-going wrong and don't set jail 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 afore us everywhere we turn there aren't a condescension you can show the labourer then that he won't take as ready and as grateful as a man can be for he has a patient peaceful willing heart but you must put his rightful spirit in him first for whether he's a wreck and ruin such as me or is like one of them that stand here now his spirit is divided from you at this time bring it back gentle folks bring it back bring it back afore the day comes when even his bible changes in his altered mind and the words seem to him to read as they have sometimes read in my own eyes in jail whither thou goest i can not go where thou lodgest i do not lodge thy people are not my people nor thy god my god a sudden stir and agitation took place in hall trotty thought at first that several had risen to eject the man and hence this change in its appearance but another moment showed him that the room and all the company had vanished from his sight and that his daughter was again before him seated at her work but in a poorer meaner garret than before 
and with no Lillian by her side. The frame at which she had worked was put away upon a shelf and covered up. The chair in which she had sat was turned against the wall. A history was written in these little things, and in Meg's grief-worn face. Oh, who could fail to read it? Meg strained her eyes upon her work until it was too dark to see the threads, and when the night closed in she lighted her feeble candle and worked on. Still her old father was invisible about her, looking down upon her, loving her, how dearly loving her, and talking to her in a tender voice about the old times and the bells. Though he knew, poor Trotty, though he knew she could not hear him. A great part of the evening had worn away when a knock came at her door. She opened it. A man was on the threshold. A slouching, moody, drunken sloven, wasted by intemperance and vice, and with his matted hair and unshorn beard in wild disorder but with some traces on him, too, of having been a man of good proportion and good features in his youth. He stopped until he had her leave to enter, and she, retiring a pace or two from the open door, silently and sorrowfully looked upon him. Trotty had his wish. He saw Richard. "'May I come in, Margaret?' "'Yes, come in, come in.' It was well that Trotty knew him before he spoke, for with any doubt remaining on his mind, the harsh, discordant voice would have persuaded him that it was not Richard, but some other man. There were but two chairs in the room. She gave him hers, and stood at some short distance from him, waiting to hear what he had to say. He sat, however, staring vacantly at the floor, with a lustreless and stupid smile. A spectacle of such deep degradation, of such abject hopelessness, of such a miserable downfall, that she put her hands before her face and turned away, lest he should see how much it moved her. Roused by the rustling of her dress or some such trifling sound, he lifted his head, and began to speak as if there had been no pause since he entered. "'Still at work, Margaret. You work late.' "'I generally do.' "'And early?' "'And early.' "'So she said. She said you never tired or never owned that you tired. Not all the time you lived together.' not even when you fainted between work and fasting. But I told you that the last time I came. You did, she answered, and I implored you to tell me nothing more, and you made me a solemn promise, Richard, that you never would. A solemn promise, he repeated with a drivelling laugh and vacant stare. A solemn promise, to be sure. A solemn promise. Awakening, as it were, after a time, in the same manner as before, he said with sudden animation, How can I help it, Margaret? What am I to do? She has been to me again. Again, cried Meg, clasping her hands. Oh, does she think of me so often? Has she been again? Twenty times again said Richard. Margaret, she haunts me. She comes behind me in the street and thrusts it in my hand. I hear her foot upon the ashes when I'm at my work. Ha, <laughs> ha, that aren't often. And before I can turn my head, her voice is in my ear saying, Richard, don't look round. For heaven's love, give her this. She brings it where I live. She sends it in letters, she taps at the window and lays it on the sill. What can I do? Look at it! He held out in his hand a little purse and chinked the money it enclosed. 
hide it said meg hide it when she comes again tell her richard that i love her in my soul that i never lie down to sleep but i bless her and pray for her that in my solitary work i never cease to have her in my thoughts that she is with me night and day that if i died to-morrow i would remember her with my last breath but that i cannot look upon it he slowly recalled his hand and crushing the purse together said with a kind of drowsy thoughtfulness i told her so i told her so as plain as words could speak i've taken this gift back and left it at her door a dozen times since then but when she came at last and stood before me face to face what could i do you saw her exclaimed meg you saw her oh lilian my sweet girl oh lilian lilian i saw her he went on to say not answering but engaged in the same slow pursuit of his own thoughts there she stood trembling how does she look richard does she ever speak of me is she thinner my old place at the table what's in my old place and the frame she taught me our old work on has she burnt it richard there she was i heard her say it meg checked her sobs and with the tears streaming from her eyes bent over him to listen not to lose a breath with his arms resting on his knees and stooping forward in his chair as if what he said were written on the ground in some half legible character which it was his occupation to decipher and connect he went on richard i have fallen very low and you may guess how much i have suffered in having this sent back when i can bear to bring it in my hand to you but you loved her once even in my memory dearly others stepped in between you fears and jealousies and doubts and vanities estranged you from her but you did love her even in my memory i suppose i did he said interrupting himself for a moment i did that's neither here nor there oh richard if you ever did if you have any memory for what is gone and lost take it to her once more once more tell her how i laid my head upon your shoulder where her own head might have lain and was so humble to you richard tell her that you looked into my face and saw the beauty which she used to praise all gone all gone and in its place a poor wan hollow cheek that she would weep to see tell her everything and take it back and she will not refuse again she will not have the heart so he sat musing and repeating the last words until he woke again and rose you won't take it margaret she shook her head and motioned an entreaty to him to leave her good night margaret good night he turned to look upon her struck by her sorrow and perhaps by the pity for himself which trembled in her voice it was a quick and rapid action and for the moment some flash of his old bearing kindled in his form in the next he went as he had come nor did this glimmer of a quenched fire seem to light him to a quicker sense of his debasement 
in any mood, in any grief, in any torture of the mind or body, Meg's work must be done. She sat down to her task and plied it. Night, midnight, still she worked. She had a meagre fire, the night being very cold, and rose at intervals to mend it. The chimes rang half-past twelve while she was thus engaged, and when they ceased she heard a gentle knocking at the door. Before she could so much as wonder who was there at that unusual hour, it opened. O oh, youth and beauty, happy as ye should be, look at this! O oh, youth and beauty, blessed and blessing all within your reach, and working out the ends of your beneficent creator, look at this! She saw the entering figure, screamed its name, cried, Lillian! It was swift and fell upon its knees before her, clinging to her dress. Up, dear, up, Lillian, my own dearest. Never more, Meg, never more. Here, here, close to you, holding to you, feeling your dear breath upon my face. Sweet Lillian. Darling Lillian, child of my heart, no mother's love can be more tender. Lay your head upon my breast. Never more, Meg, never more. When I first looked into your face, you knelt before me. On my knees before you, let me die. Let it be here. You have come back, my treasure. We will live together, work together, hope together, die together. Ah, oh, kiss my lips, Meg. Fold your arms about me. Press me to your bosom. Look kindly on me, but don't raise me. Let it be here. Let me see the last of your dear face upon my knees. Oh, youth and beauty, happy as ye should be, look at this. Oh, youth and beauty, working out the ends of your beneficent creator, look at this. Forgive me, Meg, so dear. So, dear, forgive me. I know you do. I see you do. But say so, Meg. She said so, with her lips on Lillian's cheek, and with her arms twined round, she knew it now, a broken heart. His blessing on you, dearest love. Kiss me once more. He suffered her to sit beside his feet and dry them with her hair. Oh, Meg, what mercy and compassion. As she died, the spirit of the child returning innocent and radiant touched the old man with its hand and beckoned him away. End of the Third Quarter